you got it, man. Just, uh, you know, you, you start running with the ball and we'll just start playing. Oh, hey, sounds great. Hey, welcome to another great edition of the, of the Frankie Slauson Show right here on KTech uh, and also here on YouTube as well. I'm your host, Frankie Slauson. And today we got, uh, well, as you know, we've been doing lots of uh, interviews as of late with a lot of different iconic uh, uh, people that are iconic in, in, in pop culture. And today I got a guy who is well known. If you don't know this guy, then I don't know where the hell you guys have been. Uh, especially for for you younger guys, younger people out there who uh, who who like Justin Bieber and all that stuff. You know, <laughs> uh, I have I have with me a legendary man known as Greg Kidd from the Greg Kidd Band. How's it going, Greg? Frankie, it's a pleasure to be here, and let me just say I'm looking forward to, you know, just chewing the fat with you, man. Anything you want to talk about is okay with me. Hey, sounds great. You know, I, I like how, you, how you're how kind of a cool, calm, and collective person. Well, you know what? I, I've been through the ringer a couple of times. There's nothing left. <laughs> There's no fight left in me. I, I'm always going for the, what, what do they call that, the... Uh, path of least resistance okay well that's okay you know, I've been, i tell you i've been beat up by pros for you know most of my adult life and uh yeah I, you get to the point where you get a pretty thick skin about it and let's face it man in this world you know, i was blessed to have this job so whatever happens is okay with me oh, you know I, I mean I, I don't i don't have any attitude about it I'm happy for what we did. Um, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm thankful that I got my chance. And, and that that's kind of what it's all about, you know, just kind of getting a, a chance, an opportunity to, to show what you can – what what it is that you're you know to show your talent and, and uh, you definitely uh, you definitely did that you know throughout your music musical career and uh, kind of to, to start off the interview uh, what kind of got you uh, started for those that don't know what got you started uh, with music in the first place? Well, actually, I always was into music. You know, I found a guitar out behind, out in the alley behind my mother's house in Baltimore when I was about 13. And I, I fixed it with, you know, I had a cracked neck, so I glued it and tried to screw it back together again. And my mother felt sorry for it. She took me down to a place that repaired guitars, but it was hopeless. So she, uh, she took me to a pawn shop. I bought my first guitar. It was a $40 guitar, a Harmony. I remember, a Harmony. And it had F holes. This this thing was old. In in the olden days, it was old. It was insane. And get this, my mother had asked around, like all the people in the family, like, where's the best place to get a guitar? You know, to get you know a good deal because we, we didn't have a lot of money. And my uncle James said, oh, you got to go down to the pawn shop. That's where it's at. You got to oh, go sure. to the pawn shop. They got everything at the pawn shop. It happened that the pawn shop was on Baltimore Street, which is known in Baltimore as the block. Uh-huh. And it's all strip clubs and bars and peak shows. And I'm telling you, it was, you know, it was Times Square in the 40s. And my mother dragging me down, and I'm like, my eyes were bugging out. We're walking past, there's Blake Star in the doorway to her nightclub with her titties hanging out. <laughs> you know, going, hey, little boy, come on in here, let your mama let you in here. And I'm like, whoa, my eyes were bugged out. I was freaking out. Finally, we got to the end of the block. She pulls me into the pawn okay. shop which we had to run the gauntlet of sex clubs to get to the pawn shop. I'll never forget, my mother was like a woman of iron. She had a grip on my arm, and she was moving as fast as I had ever seen her move. Like a battleship. Oh, jeez. Anyway, so we go in the pawn shop, and the guy sells me, I remember to this day, 40 bucks was my first guitar. Uh, and the rest is history. It was a lot of fun too. And the walk back, by the way, was incredible as well. Oh, I'm you know sure. I mean? In those days, they had pictures of the strippers, and these were like '50s and '60s strippers, right? These were like Tempest Storm and Blaze Star, all these you know iconic Betty Page style women. 
and he'd be blowing up pictures of him, you know, in the, in the window, in the storefront. You could, I mean, you, you could drag a 13-year-old kid down that street, my eyes are going, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Oh, I can only imagine. I mean, I mean, uh, seeing what you got to see as a young man. I mean, yeah, most most of the kids nowadays uh, don't know what a good time is if it, if it fell right in their face. I would say. <laughs> Back in the day, uh, and you know, once you have your first guitar, it's over, man. You you're moving. You you know, it's like whatever you just got on the bus, and everybody else is already on the bus. You know. Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. Well, my my co-host just got back from his uh, his other job, and he's uh, he's just joining us here. Uh, he just got home. Uh, uh, his name is Old Reb, and uh, say hi to say hi to Greg Kinder, Old Reb. <laughs> hey, Greg, I'm a fan of yours, buddy, hey. and you you know what? Oh, I, thank you. I can't believe you're thank still you. rocking. Should, should I call you Reb? Yeah, you can call me Reb if you like. All right. Yeah. Nice to meet you, man, and thanks for being a fan. You bet. Yeah, and, uh, well, uh, when I uh, told Reb that I was going to be doing this interview with you, see, he and I, we, we, we do a radio show together. We do two shows together. Yeah. We do we do my show, which is the Frankie Slauson Show, on Friday nights from 10 p.m. to 1 a.m., just to get that plug out there, of course. <laughs> and then we do his show on Sunday mornings from 9 a.m. to noon uh, called the Reb Ryder Show. So it's almost uh, sim- similar to each other, but we... we, we uh, what we try to do is we try to bring back the good old days of, of radio. And uh, I know for yeah. a fact that you were a radio host, too, for, uh, for a time being. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was 17 years as the morning guy on K-Fox Radio wow. in the Bay Area here. And that was, you know, about 15 years in San Jose and a couple of years in San Francisco when they moved us up there. But uh, that was quite an experience, man, getting up at 4 a.m. for 17 years. It's been, what's it been, a year and a half since I got fired? I still am sleeping until after 10 o'clock every damn day. <laughs> well, that's better I than losing on Jeopardy, right? Up, yeah, I'm still trying to catch up on sleep that I lost, you know, 15 years ago. Yeah, yeah. But I'm sure it's kind of cool is to say that, you know, other than just beca- being a musician, that you got to be a, a radio host, too, because, uh, you know, that, that I think, it, you know, being in radio and anybody that's been involved in radio, I think it's just a, a neat thing, and we need to keep that going. You know? Oh, yeah. Either that or, you know, you're just one of those guys. Remember that Jamaican guy has got 27 jobs? <laughs> I got so many jobs, man. I also <laughs> like to do your wash, too, man. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, I, you know, it, when, after I got, after my radio show ended, which was uh, the first of the year, in a year and a half, okay, so I had gone out, the first thing I did was write a book. What do you do? You write a book. I wrote a novel called Rubber Soul, which is my, it's my fifth book, actually, and it came out, it got really great reviews. In fact, if you go over to Amazon... And, and read them, it's just fabulous. So I just finished, and that was that was from Premier Digital Publishing. That's the name of the publishing okay. company. PDP, they shortened for PDP. <laughs> anyway, PDP signed me for the next book, which is the sequel to Rubber Soul. It's called Painted Black, and it's about the death of Brian Jones. So I'm 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 working on the uh, uh, you know I'm working on the one and working on the other one too. So after that one came out, PDP was bought. This is all. This is what happens in life. They were swallowed up by a bigger fish called Open Road Publishing, and they got a lot more money and they're a lot bigger. And they bought them and their whole catalog, including me. So now my new book's going to be coming out still in September, but it's going to be on Open Road Publishing, and it should be everywhere that books are sold. And, of course, you can get it on Amazon or gregkin.com. By the way, your source for all things Greg Kin uh, <laughs> is gregkin.com. You, you want to know something? You want to know how many pimples I got? Go over there. I think they got them listed. <laughs> Hey Greg, would you like to hear hear a story how I got to be your fan? Uh, okay, I'd like to hear that. I'm going down the road on a motorcycle, and I got a stereo system, and I hear the breakup song, and I 
I get back to the house and I tell a guy, get me everything on this Greg Kin guy. Everything. I want tapes, whatever. And then when I got the all the music, I'd, I'd jump back on the motorcycle and go down the road rocking out to you. So that's how that happened. <laughs> Um, you know what? It's good motorcycle music because it's like one man, you know, one song, one guy, one helmet, one world. You yep. know? <laughs> exactly. And, yeah. You know, and I got I got a lot of biker friends, and uh, we've always been a favorite in the biker community. Just and you know, it's a lot of it is you know like who we we used to hang out with the Doobie Brothers. And we did a lot of gigs opening for the Doobies. And, you know, the Doobies got a huge thing uh, going with the bikers. Right. And kind of like, you know, it's kind of like the Deadheads, you know. You you just become part of that scene after, you know, after all these years. I mean, geez, we, I remember opening for the Dead back in 1978. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, Martin, you think that? I must have been 12 years old, man. Jeez. I remember, big this, they had backstage, this was at Spartan Stadium, so the backstage area was this huge Moroccan tent, you know, like something out of Sahara's Eye, something out of, out of Alibaba and the 40 <laughs> Huge Moroccan, all these big pillows on the floor, and I, and, 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 and uh, Phil Lesh says, hey, Greg, come on in for a minute, come on and say hi to the guys, because I knew them all. So I popped in there, the whole band is sitting around on the, on the floor, around in these big pillows, smoking on this hookah. And this, I swear to God, this sucker was like six feet tall and had a bowl in it the size of, you know, your grandma's, you know, coffee mug. And it was huge. And it had about five or six stems coming off of it. And everybody's like, you know, puffing away on this thing. And they, they, the first thing they said, sit down. Boom, I sat down. And, and Garcia's next to me, first thing Garcia he says, he says, take this and suck on it. <laughs> <laughs> and I started, I started smoking that ash, man. And look, my guys are from Berkeley. We thought we could hang with the big boys, you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, absolutely. There's nothing that we could do. I mean, it pales next to the dead. Those guys, I got so whacked, and this is one of the few times this has ever happened to me in my entire life. I got two stone to play. <laughs> when they came up and they said, five minutes, Mr. King, I said, well, what do you mean for five minutes to what? <laughs> oh, five dear. minutes before you go on, you idiot. Now get going. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, I stood up, man. I was like wobbly. We go out there and the first, like, I, I didn't know what to do. I was just too wrecked. So we did, I think we did our two big hits right out of the box. I think it was Break Up Song and something else. Our two hits of, of the day got no reaction we do a 20 minute jam version of Johnny Be Good and we got a standing ovation <laughs> now you go figure the uh. message was forget your hits just jam and, and, and you know here have another puff while you're at it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty. That's uh, definitely a, an interesting story that you can tell the grandkids. That's for sure. <laughs> um, yeah, you know what? I got to write a book just about my experiences, but you know, backstage experiences. I got a million great stories. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, there's a lot of stuff. You know, you, you go on the road for 20 years. Shit happens. What can I say? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's for sure. Uh, you uh, before we we started this interview, you said that you've been to to Rapid City before. Was it that? Do you, do you remember where what venue it was that you played at here? I we, I remember that we played at an outdoor festival, and I remember there was three or four bands on the bill, and I remember maybe one of the bands might have been Blue Oyster Cult, <clears throat> and I'm thinking maybe one of the other bands might have been Blondie. Okay. And it was like in an outdoor venue. Does that ring a bell? Well, I've only been to Rapid City here for a short time. Uh, Rab's been around well, South Dakota for a little longer than I have. Well, I'm not thinking what that would be, Greg, but maybe it was, did it have something to do maybe with the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally or no? Yeah, it might have been, might have been. Been a long I time. I the whole thing, guys. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been a long time. That's why, because hey, we... This, this, yeah, at this point in life, I can't tell whether it's true or I, or I dreamed it. <laughs> well, that, that almost... I quit, 
That almost sounds well, like the Buffalo chip. About, I quit smoking about eight, ten years ago. I quit smoking cigarettes. Uh-huh. And uh, I was so guilty about it that I used to dream that I smoked. And then I <laughs> wake up in the middle of the night and I felt guilty. Like, did I just smoke? Did I, you know, I had to smell my breath. Did I just drink, sleepwalk and just smoke a cigarette? <laughs> but no, it was just the power of dreams. Yeah. Well, that's 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 pretty exciting. No, we don't expect you to know every 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 story. I mean, that's that's. Uh, but I, I'm pretty sure you did play here because you were talking about Mount Rushmore and the the the, uh, the oh, gift yeah. shop. <laughs> one of that one of the great gift shops of all time. Now, back in the day, back in the '80s, when I was on the road, I was an aficionado of great gift shops. We used to go to the gift shop wherever we were at. You know, me and the whole the whole band to go, and we 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 love gift shops. And I'll tell you that Mount Rushmore is a, is a great one. You know what the best one is? Is uh, Cooperstown uh, Baseball Hall of Fame gift shop. Woo! <laughs> that, it's a beauty. Uh, let's see. Oh, you know what else? The great Graceland. Across the street from Graceland, you know, Elvis's house, yeah. there's like a shopping center with everything <clears throat> Elvis. I mean, it's like a whole block. A huge building the size of a of a uh, you know like of a Macy's and it's all Elvis stuff it was unbelievable I didn't know you could spend a grand in a gift shop until I went there <laughs> uh, I bought Elvis uh, clocks wall clocks you know what I mean Elvis tapestries Elvis hangings Elvis everything I, it, it was insane you must have been a really huge fan of Elvis then huh oh yeah back in the day we, we got the tour of Graceland it was pretty cool you know, wherever we go, I, I'm very cognizant of rock and roll history. We always like to pay our respects like we were in Memphis. And, uh, you know, you want you, you definitely want to go to see Graceland, pay your respects to Elvis, see his grave. But you got to go to uh, Sun Records and see uh, the Sun Records studio uh, in, on uh, South uh, Union Avenue. It's unbelievable. It's like when you go to uh, Chicago and you go to Chess Records at 2120 South Michigan Avenue, and you realize everybody from the Stones to Bo Diddley, Chuck Berry, all of that stuff was recorded in that room. So there's a lot of rock history all around us. So so as a musician and and, uh, with the career that you've had, uh, what do you think of uh, the music of today? And are you a big fan of a lot of the music of today. Well, I'm, telling you, I'm trying to like it, man. I really am trying to like it. But it's not that easy. First of all, nobody seems to be writing really good songs. Like, I'm always on the lookout for a good song. You know, the kind of song gets in your head. You yeah. Singing it in the shower and, and all that kind of stuff. Seems like all the songs in, in my day used to do that. They, they'd stay with you. A lot of the songs now are just, just that one, you know, they'll, they'll get a hook. But you know, they won't develop the song. They'll just beat you to death with the hook. And I just feel like it's a period of rock and roll right now. Because, you know, it's like cyclical. Cyclical. <laughs> it's cyclical. Yes, there we go. There we go. It goes around. That's what I mean. It goes around and around. And around. Uh, <laughs> you know, eventually, uh, everything's going to come back to what it, you know where it was, to the back to the basics. Yeah, and back, right now you're back to the breakup where, song. <laughs> what's that? Back up to back to the breakup song in that era. That was good rock yeah, and roll. Well, that was that. Hey, we went in there. We did that in two takes. <laughs> that's the way you know. That's the way that you got to record rock and roll with that kind of attitude. Yep. Um, of course, that was recorded back in the analog on a sixteen-track machine. We recorded that song at Fantasy Studios in Berkeley in the same room where Credence made all those great records, you know, like <laughs> Born on the Bayou and wow. Green River <laughs> That's and all awesome. that stuff, Proud Mary. Yeah. It was all recorded in Studio C at uh, Fantasy Studios and uh, that's the same room that we did the breakup song in. Ironically, it's got a little bit of a Credence groove to it. Have you noticed that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can definitely yeah. tell that. Definitely. I do, too. Yeah, and you know what the cool thing about that studio was? You didn't have to go through the reception area to get to it. It was in the corner of the building, and it had a door right to the outside, right to the street. So you could just step in and out, go out and have a smoke or whatever, 
uh, you didn't have to go through the front and go by the receptionist and sign in and sign out and all that stuff. It was way cooler. It was a it was a rock and roll way to make records, you know. So, like, when when you first uh, scored with your first uh, first hit, which was was it the breakup song that was your first hit? You know, well, actually, I'll tell you, that was our seventh album, believe it or not. Yeah. Our, we had some hits earlier, but they weren't, they weren't like, top 40. We had, for instance, I believe that the first single that I had that got to the top 100 was For You, which was the cover of the Bruce Springsteen song. It was a picture sleeve single. And, you know, that got a lot of airplay, and a lot of people dug it. It was one of the, it was the earliest known uh, Springsteen cover and Bruce started doing my version of For You live around the country and saying I'm going to do the Great Ken version <laughs> and he did my version live and it blew my mind and it was like you know suddenly you know my stock went up as a result yeah. uh, and then he gave me Rendezvous which, which he said he was going to give to the Knack but for some reason he did and he gave it to me and, and the rest is history so we had a we had a nice relationship, uh, although the last time I jammed with Bruce was at a place called the Playpen in New Jersey. It was about six years ago. We had a jam session with, like, Elliot Murphy and uh, a whole bunch of guys. It was a real. It was a songwriters jam session, and they made a. a they made a, uh, a bootleg out of it called Live at the Playpen. And you can buy it out there. You can actually hear me jamming yeah. with Bruce Springsteen. Unbelievable! <laughs> but true. So what was your, uh, from what you can remember, what was your first real taste of success when you when you were starting to get known? I remember there was there, we started playing clubs, and then after a while we started getting airplay, and you know we were getting media attention and, and lots of articles, or and we were touring all the time. Because but in those days you could tour with FM airplay. You didn't necessarily have to have a, sing, a, a hit single. You could just you know go into uh, you know Akron and play the local club because the station was playing stuff off the album. So we did that for a long time. But I remember playing a club in San Jose, California, right down the road here, play, called the Odyssey Room, which was a big deal because it was a big club back in those days. And I remember our dressing room was right outside the women's bathroom, okay? Yeah. So you could hear what they were saying inside the women's bathroom <laughs> in our dressing room just because of the way the acoustics were, right? So I hear these chicks talking, it's like halftime, right? And we're back there, I guess we were doing blow or whatever we used to do, smoking a joint, <laughs> chugging beers, who knows. <laughs> we were busy doing what we did, and we hear these chicks talking, and I hear the one, and one says to the other one, she says, do you think Greg Kim is his real name? <laughs> and the other chick says, is whose real name? <laughs> That's when I knew that I had arrived. Oh wow! <laughs> you know, it's yeah. Like when when weird when Weird Al does a parody of your song, you know you've arrived. Oh yeah, it's okay. You go into history books. <laughs> you're there. So you know, I, I we had a lot of great stuff. We were on Saturday Night Live. We were we opened for the Rolling Stones on a West Coast tour. We had a number one record. We toured the world, went you know all over, played in Paris and everything. So you know, I look back on it; it was it was just a great ride, man. I I, I can't imagine that I pulled all this crap off. How did I do it? You know, <laughs> everybody in the beginning, you always said, "Oh, it's impossible. You'll never get a record deal." And we got a record deal. <laughs> oh, you guys will never have a hit record. Oh, we had a hit record. <laughs> oh, you guys will never have another one. Oh, we had a couple. Of them. <laughs> oh, you'll never get a. You'll never write a book. And I wrote a book. You guys will never get that published. And I got it published. And you'll never get a radio job. So I got a radio job. Hey, you'll never be a morning guy. I, you know, I, all my life, people have been telling me why you can't do stuff. And I'm telling you right now, from my experiences, 
there's no reason. You can do anything. You know, don't worry about how hard it is. That's my advice, buddy. Here we go into the advice column right here. Sure. Great kid for advice. <laughs> young whippersnappers. <laughs> well, you kids, I just want you to understand. <laughs> that, you know, what I'm saying here is, you got to do it because you love it. You got to do it because it's in your soul. You don't do it for the money, and you don't do it for the recognition. Uh, if you're going to be an artist, don't worry about like you know. When I started writing books, I, it was real hard, and people told me, "You got to go to college, and you got to do this, and you got." And I said, "No, I'm just going to do it." And I was stupid enough and naive enough to believe that I could do it. So when I say you're stupid good, that's a good thing. That means that you just don't realize that you could fail. You, it's, you know what I mean? You just only think in positive terms. And, you know, hey, look, nothing's impossible. And these are, you know, learning how to play a guitar and write a song, that's a craft. You can learn a craft. Yeah. Uh, writing books is a craft. Being on the radio is a craft. You can learn these things. And I, I spent an entire lifetime in rock and roll in one form or another, either playing it or playing it on the radio or talking about it. But, you know, like the guy on Saturday Night Live, rock and roll been very, very good to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I really do appreciate uh, you taking the time to, to talk with us and let us uh, ask you some questions. Do you have any more questions at all there, Reb, for, for Greg? Well, you know what? I'd love to uh, get up in your neck of the woods and play a live gig. The band, you know, I put the band together. My son is now the lead guitar player, and the band is hotter than it's ever been. You know, Dave Dams has been with me 20 years on drums. Uh, got Robert Berry on bass. Got a uh, got a. Uh, Dave Med from the tubes on keyboards. Please. We got a really good band right now. We got some got a whole bunch of gigs coming up this summer. And uh, I'd love to get up in your neck of the woods. If there's a promoter up there, you know, look us up. We'd love to play. We're gonna be out and about all summer long. And uh, that's gonna be the key word for the summer. Get out and rock and roll, have some fun. I think uh, we could probably talk to the uh, the Civic Center. We got we got an event center here in Rapid City called the Rushmore, or the I think it's the Rushmore Plaza Civic Center, and that's where all the uh, indoor events are held anyway. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, I'm wide open, and, and plus I got to tell you, there's a lot of acts that are out there right now touring. Old friends of ours, guys that we've known forever, like Cheap Trick is out there. Aerosmith is out there, you know, th there's a ton of bands going to be out there. Steve Miller's out there, yes. Journey's out there. Uh, it's going to be a good summer for rock and roll. Oh, Hopefully that's sure. we'll get some of that coming to your town. Yeah, and if, if we ever are able to make that happen, it'd be great to meet you. You seem like a pretty down-to-earth guy. Yeah, well, listen, man, I, I've been blessed to have a great career, and... Uh, you know, listen, they're a bunch for fortune. I could have wound up the guy sweeping up the station. That could have been me, too. But they're a bunch for fortune, goes you and I, my friend. <laughs> All right, Greg. Well, thanks again for letting me uh, do this interview with you. Uh, Reb, you got anything else to say? To Well, it's just been an honor, Greg, to... to uh... Hey, thank you, guys. And yeah. You know what? I, I really appreciate talking to true believers like yourselves, you know, and... Uh, um, what can I say? That's it. <laughs> Keep an eye out for the Great Kin Band. Go over to greatkin.com and everybody's happy. Exactly. And that's that's what we want people to be. We want people to be happy. The world's too, you know, you, you turn on the news, there's always something bad, negative out there. we got to get people happy again. I hear you, man. I hear you. I think you go, like, what's, what's today's bad news? <laughs> hey, today's bad news is there's no bad news. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're David Sterling, but that's a, that's a or, or Donald Sterling, that's a different story. It's a beautiful thing. <laughs> that's right. All right, you guys. I'll see you down the line. Thanks for interviewing me. I, I appreciate being on the show. Let's do it again. You know, the book's coming out in September. Okay. Maybe we could do something in the fall. It just hooked up. I'll, you know, we'll bump up the book a little bit. Yeah, that'd be great. It'd be great to have a yeah, happy well, address again. Yeah, my email, so hang on to that, and we'll try to stay in touch. Hey, here. Greg, if you ever do the Sturgis Motorcycle Rally, my house is open to you, my friend. Really? Are you in town? Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. 
Well, you know, my buddy's a cheap trick. They keep telling me, you got to come down, man. You got to come down. It's unbelievable. I think they played there with Aerosmith last year. Oh, awesome. All right, Greg. Well, thanks again for letting us do the interview. We appreciate it. All right, bro. Thanks a lot, you guys. And, and take care of yourselves. You too, man. And that was Greg Kidd from the Greg Kidd Band. What do you think there, Rev, after doing this awesome interview? First well, time ever together. <laughs> I ran a little late, so I come in second hand on it. But by God, I'll tell you what, that's awesome. <laughs> that's just an awesome interview. And what he's one of us. Yeah. He's one of us. Oh, definitely is. Yeah, he's a down-to-earth fella. And uh, basically, for all you guys who, who want to know, well, that was Greg Kidd, you know, the Greg Kidd band. And, and uh, check out his music. He's not just a one-hit wonder. A lot of people like to label him as a one-hit wonder, but no, he's he's uh, he's done a lot with music. He's versatile, and when we get down the pike here a little bit, yeah. we're, we're going to play a little, a little of his music. Exactly. Yep. But anyway, uh, we'll be right back with some more uh, great music from Rev and I here on whatever show we play this on. <laughs> We have no idea. Well, but one thing about it, it's a Frankie Slauson production. <laughs> That's <so>. right. <laughs> All right, we'll be right back after this quick commercial break on K-Tech. <laughs> 